Okay, so yeah, for the third time, thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation. Okay, that's good. <laughs> yeah, so this night I didn't have enough time to prepare slides again, so this is going to be a Blackboard talk. And yeah, I'm trying to apply what I learned in Omar's talk in terms of Blackboard organization. So let's see how, how well I can do. Um, yeah, let's uh, recall a little bit uh, where we're at. So I'm looking at this infinite dimensional Teichmüller space, the space of hyperbolic structures on a surface up to diffeomorphisms, which fix the boundary. And by hyperbolic structure on a surface, I mean, uh, we choose, an, uh, well, it's defined in terms of an atlas, where the charts take values in the closed Poincare disk. So these are hyperbolic metrics, which have the same boundary behavior like the metric on the Poincare disk. They become singular at the, at the boundary. Okay, and we look at the corresponding moduli space. So the subscript zero means um, the identity component. So different morphisms that are homotopic to the identity. On the space, one then still has an action of different morphisms of the boundary, or to be precise, it's the universal cover of that. We can twist the boundary and that gives, so you twist the boundary, uh, you continue into the interior and that gives new hyperbolic metrics. And there's a natural map from the space to the dual of the Vera Zora algebra at level one, which by definition is the space of Hill operators on the boundary. That's something I discussed in the first lecture. And in the second lecture, I explained uh, actually the space of Hill operators can also be identified with the space of projective structures on the boundary. And from that perspective, it's kind of easy to see how this map goes. You have these charts taking values in the closed Poincare disk you just restrict them to the boundary, then they take values in the boundary of the Poincare disk, which is identified with RP1. And what I would like to explain is that actually this infinite dimension Teichmüller space has a natural symplectic structure with this map phi as a moment map. So, so this action of diffeomorphisms is Hamiltonian, and so it becomes a Hamiltonian Verazoro space. The boundary restriction becomes a moment map for that action. Right, so I, I, re I realize not all of you will really care about symplectic structures, um, but I believe that some of the techniques that show up, or at least one little trick that shows up might be of interest. Yeah, which will come at the, at the very end. So there's gonna be something very, very special happening somewhere towards the end, <laughs> if you pay attention. Okay, so. Well, since I don't expect that people really know so much uh, symplectic geometry, let me very briefly recall what it actually means to be a moment map. So, moment maps. And, oh, I failed already. So there's going to be two here, right? Mm -hmm. Moment maps. So the setting is you have a symplectic manifold. So omega is a two form, which is closed and non-degenerate and you have some group acting on it, preserving the symplectic structure. And this group action then has its generating vector fields, which I denote by psi subscript M. So these are vector fields on M, kind of the infinitesimal generators for the action. So that's for all Lie algebra elements. And then the definition of a moment map is, so a map, a moment map, which really should be called momentum map. I think the reason it's called moment map is really that, that it was mistranslated from French. It's really a momentum map, but in honor of, of Costant and Gilman and so on, I'm gonna call this moment map. Uh, so a moment map is an equivalent map from our manifold into the dual of the Lie algebra, such that I take the contractions of omega with these generating vector fields, and my sign convention is minus D of the psi component of this map. So whenever you have such a um, symplectic action, you can see that the contractions of omega with generating vector fields 
have to be closed. And so we require that them, they're exact. So we can find Hamiltonians for these vector fields, for these side components that then Hamiltonians. But I also want the map to be G equivariant using the coercion action on G dual, which for example, if the group is compact, you can always arrange by averaging. Okay, so basic example is example is the, the quotient orbits. So for quotient orbits, the mom map is simply the inclusion into the dual of the Lie algebra. And I'm not even writing down the symplectic structure here. There's a unique symplectic structure with the property that inclusion is a mom map for the action. Right, and if you have a um, Hamiltonian group action, you can find some, uh, you can construct symplectic quotients. Uh, which are denoted like this, M mod mod G. You take the zero level set of the moment map and divide out the group action. So you might assume that zero is a regular value of the moment, so that this is really a manifold. And the statement is that you uh, pull back the symplectic form to the zero level set, it descends to the quotient. And so you get a symplectic form on the symplectic quotient. More generally, if you have a coordinate orbit, you can do a symplectic reduction at that coordinate orbit. And well, it is by inverse of the orbit quotient by G, but here it's a bit more tricky because if you pull back the symplectic form to this preimage of the orbit, it actually does not descend. Instead, the way one does it is by the so-called shifting trick. You take the manifold times the orbit with minus sim the symplectic structure, then you look at the diagonal action and then take the symplectic portion of that. In some vague analogy, you should think of coordinate orbits as like irreducible representations. And this is like taking the um, isotypical component. You tensor with the irreducible con uh, representation dual and then take the invariance. Okay, so that's symplectic reduction. Now, uh, more generally, Uh, so in, in this context with gauge theory and so on, uh, I need in these infinite dimensional situations, I can consider mom maps taking values at affine spaces. So if E is an affine space over G star with a G action. So this is like what I considered in lecture one. So it's not really a G star, it's an affine space, which just looks like G star, more or less. So the underlying linear space is G star with the cogent action. If you have this situation, I can consider corresponding affine moment maps. And yeah, it's the same uh, definition. Well, you may observe that pairing pi with psi then doesn't really make sense because you're in affine space. It's not G dual really, but you just write it like this. So D of phi takes values in the tangent spaces. The tangent spaces are G star, so the pairing again makes sense. So that's then the moment map condition. Important is that this should still be G covariant. Right, the main example we need for this is from gauge theory, the so called Atia bot example. So, here the setting is that we have a principal bundle over, over a surface. Uh, 
And the symplectic space I want to consider is the space of all connections with the action of the gauge group. Now, so it's, this is an infinite dimensional symplectic manifold with an infinite dimensional group acting on it. Um, well, to make life a bit easier, I'm going to take my principles bundle to be simply trivial. So it's just the trivial bundle. Then the space of connections is identified with Lie alpha valued one forms. The gauge group is functions with values ng, and the gauge action is given by this formula. G bullet A is adjoint action minus DG G inverse. Get that. Okay, so I'm, I'm claiming this is a symplectic manifold with a Hamiltonian action. So first of all, what's the symplectic form? So there's the famous Atiyah bot two form. So on two tangent vectors, A and B, which are one forms on sigma with values in the Lie algebra, we define a pairing, which is the integral over sigma of A wedge B. And I forgot one important thing. Uh, my Lie algebra should have an invariant metric. So this is some invariant metric on the Lie algebra. At the outset, I should have said this. So I, I want to have some metric on the Lie algebra. No, it doesn't have to be positive definite, just non, non degenerate we want. Yeah, but non degenerate. Maybe the, the example I, I, I need later is this group SL2R. So, so we, we typically take something like the killing form, but uh, it doesn't have to be positive definite. But for it to be symplectic, it should be non-degenerate. So this is the um, symplectic form, and the mode map for the gauge action is given by the formula. So I'm, I'm saying what are the components of the mode map. It's given by the curvature of a connection. DA plus one and a half A bracket A. So this is what it is. Oh, dot psi. Yeah, I should check that this makes sense. So psi is an element in the Lie algebra of the gauge group. So yeah, write this. Psi is an element in the Lie algebra of the gauge group, which is functions on sigma with values in G. And so this would be a two form with values in G. This is a function with values in G. I take the inner product, I just get a two form, I can integrate. And this is what the moment map is. This is what the moment map is if there's no boundary. But I'm actually interested in cases where there's also a boundary. And in that case, there's an extra boundary term appearing. And that's given by the connection. So the connection you can pair with psi, that's a one form, and you can integrate it over the boundary. So you get this extra term. Actually, I'm cheating tiny little bit here. Uh, with my sign conventions, there should be a minus sign here. I can just change the orientation on the boundary to get rid of that minus sign. I want the, con the moment map to be the co uh, connection. Right. and, and so in this setting, then you can uh, do a symplectic reduction. And if you do a reduction, say in the case without boundary, let's say there's no boundary, then symplectic reduction would mean setting the curvature equal to zero, dividing out by gauge transformation. So that's the modular space of flat connections. 
if there is a boundary, then the mode map is not just the curvature, there's also this extra term. So what you can do is take a quotient by only the gauge transformations which are trivial along the boundary. There, so that's similar to what we did over there. So then uh, the mode map is still there, just a curvature. And I take that quotient, it inherits the symplectic form, but it's still infinite dimensional. And the gauge group of the boundary, which is the loop group, still acts, and its mode map is going to be this term. Right. I should mention that actually um, there's not just the action of gauge transformations, there's also the action of diffeomorphisms, which of course is relevant for my context. Thank you. You also have the action of diffeomorphisms of the surface on the space of connections. Just by pushing connections forward. So that action is Hamiltonian too. So it also preserves the symplectic structure. And it permits a mode map. What is the mode map? So for a vector field on sigma. Uh, so in terminology and notation that we've already learned, this should be like a B vector field. It should be tangent to the boundary because my diffeomorphisms preserve the boundary. So I put the B here. So for, for such a B vector field, uh, the corresponding component of the mode map is given by two terms. So this time I get a minus sign integral over sigma, the curvature of A dot uh, the uh, yeah, contraction of A with the vector field. So that term makes sense. No? If, if I take contraction of this one form with the vector field, that's a Lie algebra valued function, just like the Xi above, and then I can take the dot product, it becomes two form, I can integrate. If there's no boundary, and if there's a boundary, then there's another term, which is this one. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to, how to write this. Um, so what you do is you take the square of the connection and think of this as a quadratic differential. So it's, it's not uh, as a two form or something like that. It's, it's a quadratic differential. It's like the symmetric square. And this, so this is a quadratic differential. It's a plus two density. This is a vector field, which is a minus one density. You multiply them together. It's a one density and you can integrate. Pairing of a quadratic differential with a vector field is a one form and you can integrate. Oops. So that, that's the extra term you get in case of a boundary. All right. And yeah, so all of this works similarly if you have non trivial bundles. Unfortunately, in this context, we need to work with some non-trivial principal G bundles. Um, yeah, it's, these are basically the formulas in local trivializations. Um, maybe one thing to point out is that uh, vector fields, they don't naturally act then on, on connections anymore. Uh, what you should look at is the group of automorphisms. Right, you should kind of put these two cases together. So the gauge group acts, the diffeomorphisms don't act separately, but the group of aut automorphisms acts and has a moment map. Okay, so that, that's all I want to review about Atia bot construction. Any questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think it is, right? Yeah, when, when Anton lectures about these things, he, he points out that, in, as a matter of fact, there, there are only very few symplectic structures known to mankind. One is the symplectic structure on cogent orbits. The other one is the Atiyah-Bot symplectic structure. And that's basically about it. Cotangent bundles, maybe also. 
There are only those three examples. Okay, so now we should go back to these Teichmuller spaces. And yeah, we kind of want to make use of these few symplectic structures that are known to mankind. Oh, so eight goes there. But some of some we want to bring into the picture flat connections in this story. And actually we did this already a little bit last time. So what, what did we do last time? I recall. Um, I'm losing track, so, so, so now, now we are, uh, it's maybe section three, so back, back to hyperbolic structures. So, 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 so recall from last time that if you have a hyperbolic structure, which I can view as these hyperbolic zero metrics, or I can view them in terms of this atlas if I want, it um, gives rise, after I choose a co-frame, local co-frame, it gives rise to a flat connection. So you get these connection one forms given by this formula. So here, This alpha one, alpha two is a local co frame for the metric, and this kappa is the so called spin connection. And so you get this flat connection. The flat connection is not uniquely determined, even locally, it's only up to the rotations of the co frame. So it basically brings into the picture the action of gauge transformations. But only gauge transformations by rotations. Okay, so that looks sort of promising that we can do something with uh, Atiyah bot construction here. Um, but there are some issues here. Well, what about those flat connections? Uh, I mean, the first issue is that the construction is only local. It's basic differential geometry that we, if, if there's a surface boundary, we cannot find a global, well, I didn't say this quite right, but, but we, 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 have, we have trouble with, with global co-frames. This is a local construction. That, that's, that's one problem. So we should, view these as connections on some non-trivial principle bundle, but like what bundle? It's a bit mysterious. I point out last time that these are definitely not connections on the, on the tangent bundle. So, but, but, so, so what is it actually? Um, second issue, I forgot what is the second issue. Oh yeah, it's the sec second issue, it's, um, it's not all flat connections. I mean, maybe not a big deal, but uh, given a connection, you can define alpha one and alpha two using the formula, but they have to be a co-frame. So not all flat connection will actually do. And the most uh, serious problem is that actually it's not even a connection <laughs> um, it, because it's singular, the singularities. Recall these uh, alpha one and alpha two, and hence the, the A will not really be one forms because at the boundary they become singular. There are these zero one forms, right? So re remember, zero one forms near the boundary, they, they're like dx over y, dy over y, they, they have these singularities. So it's, it's not really a connection at the boundary. So what do we do about that? Okay, I can tell you something that we can do about that. And that, that's a little discovery which got us excited about one and a half years ago when we started working on this. Um, okay, so how do I want to put this? Yeah. 
So one, one thing to note is that uh, this so-called zero tangent bundle, which is locally spanned by these kind of singular one forms, if I restrict the zero tangent bundle to the boundary, it has a distinguished section. Namely, dy over y restricted to the boundary. If you change uh, the boundary defining function, so in this context, y is always the boundary defining function. If you change the boundary defining function, this section doesn't change. And using a co-frame rotation, I can always achieve that uh, one of those um, alpha 1, alpha 2 becomes this distinguished section along the boundary. So this is something I, I can certainly do. And the proposition uh, we have is that um, by co-frame rotation, can arrange that alpha 2 restricted to the boundary is this distinguished section. Um, so so th this is already a little bit of, of content because uh, we can certainly arrange that it becomes a positive multiple of the distinguished section, but then I'm claiming automatically it is the distinguished section because the metric is hyperbolic. And um, so, so you, you make this arrangement, so it becomes the distinguished section. And once you've done this, uh, so for such co frame, then um, so it's, it's very close then to being the standard co frame for the upper half plane. And for the upper half plane, we had, um, as you probably recall from yesterday, uh, for the upper half plane, this was uh, dy over y, uh, this was twice dx over y, and this was zero. And it becomes like that a little bit. So for such a co-frame, it's automatic that alpha 1 plus kappa is of the form y, uh, yeah, order y, put it that way. So alpha 1 and kappa, they, they're themselves singular, but the sum is actually of order y. And so what this means then is, in terms of this connection one form, oh, no. this was 9, right? It's real good. In terms of the connection one form, this means a has the form ah it has the form one half uh, dy over y so this single part plus um, something that's regular uh, and up here we have something that's, uh, okay, here we can't really say anything, so it's 1 over y times something regular. Here it has the form y times something regular according to this thing over there. And here it's minus this one. Because it has this particular form, what you can do is you can make a gauge transformation. If you apply a gauge transformation of this form, so we, we call a gauge transformation is uh, probably erased by now. So it's, it's the adjunct action minus DGG inverse. If you apply this this kind of gauge transformation, which is a singular gauge transformation, it's not well defined along the boundary. If you apply that to this A then uh, the connection becomes regular. So there's this mysterious trick. We can make the connection actually regular. So in some way, it is a connection after all. 
So maybe these singular connections actually do make sense as some sort of connections. All right, so th this is basically where we were like one and a half years ago, and then, then we tried to um, do something with this. So we um, work with flat connection one forms such that uh, alpha one and alpha two really define a co-frame. Uh, we make this condition that they've been put into this standard form. And then we do them up to gauge transformations and we use this kind of trick to treat what goes on along the boundary. But to be honest, it, it was getting a little bit cumbersome and messy. This is probably why it took us so long to, to finish this paper because we were not, never quite quite happy with the outcome. So now, now we have a different approach. Now I want to explain. So how do we actually see these things really as connections on something? This is now slide number 11. And this is about so-called geometric structures. This is, I believe, geometric structures in the sense of Klein or something like this. Um, th there's a recent book by uh, Goldman um, titled Geometric Structures and Manifolds. So it's in that sense. And yeah, again, I want to start out as, as a proposition or, or context, but it actually works much more generally. Uh, so any hyperbolic structure, say hyperbolic zero metric, determines, so let's say determine, I mean, determines canonically the following data. A principal G bundle. Over the surface, where uh, G for me is always this group PSU11, which acts on the Poincare disk, or if you want, it's PSL2R. But instead of the Poincare disk, we use the upper half plane. So there's canonically defined a principal G bundle. Uh, there's canonically defined a G equivalent. morphism from P, we call it sigma, from P into the closed concrete disk. So um, when I say morphism, what I mean is uh, P is a manifold with boundary, right? It's a principal bundle over a manifold with boundary. So it's itself a manifold with boundary. And by morphism, it's, I mean, morphism of manifolds with boundary which for me mean, means um, the pullback of a boundary defining function is again a boundary defining function. So w when you like this uh, technology with B tangent bundle and zero tangent bundle and so on, you can ask yourself, uh, how is it functorial? So what, what kind of maps really give maps on B tangent bundles and you want these kind of morphisms. So it's, it's a G great morphism in that sense. And there's a flat connection. Um, such that, and okay, that's some, some property which m m maybe I say in a, in a moment. So they, canonically, these data are, are defined. Uh, this map sigma uh, I call developing section. I mean, it's not really written as a section, but it's a G covariant map, so I can view it as a section of the bundle over sigma with fiber d bar. Because of that, I, I call it developing section. And yeah, so before I complete this, let, let's just explain where it comes from. And, and then you see that this is really a, a much more general construction. Hence, hence the book by Goldman.
Okay, so, so the, the construction of this is, uh, just recall how we defined uh, hyperbolic structures. Uh, so hyperbolic structures are defined using some charts, hidden values in the closed Poincaré disk with transition functions which are given by elements of G. So by alpha composed by beta inverse, let's call it G alpha beta. These are elements of G. And yeah, now, now you basically see what's, what's going on. Um, you have these transition functions which are constant elements of G, right? They form code cycle conditions. So that directly defines your principal G bundle with a flat connection, because they're constant. So from this you get uh, yeah, P and theta. And where does this uh, developing section come from? Well, it comes directly from, from these maps. So these are basically the local trivializations of our principal bundle. And in local trivializations, the sigma is given by this map. Okay, so this gives rise to uh, sigma. Or maybe I can say it more precisely. So if you look at the trivialization, so sigma of x and g, then this is g inverse acting on pi alpha of x in the local trivialization. So these things fit together. So that, that's how you get these data. Okay, but then I was saying, and, and I should say maybe a couple of words. Um, typically, this is considered for surfaces without, without boundary. So this is properly the, the context of geometric structures. Um, but you can do the same construction for um, similar settings. Instead of D-bar, you could uh, use various kinds of homogeneous spaces. So it also works for projective structures, for instance. So for, for, for projective structures, I would put here RP1 and same kind of construction. Yep. Oh, for, for me, a notation is always sigma is the surface with a boundary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, it, it, it really extends all the way to the boundary. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, um, typically uh, things are, are considered for, thing, for um, model spaces without boundary. So we are just applying this, this context to the context where there is a boundary which to my knowledge hasn't been uh, much developed yet. I mean, I've asked experts and, and so in, in very special cases, these kind of things have been considered, but um, yeah, not, not so much systematically. So, so this, this D bar is almost like a homogeneous space. G acts on it, but has two orbits. And it's true that uh, if you have, um, any isometry between open subsets of D bar, it's given by some element of G. So this is kind of the key property that one uses with these geometric structures. But it's not a homogeneous space, strictly speaking. It's very close to being one. So, so there, there should be some maybe inter interesting theory to be developed for, for, for slightly more general things, which are not homogeneous spaces. Okay, but yeah, I still need to complete this um, slide number 11. So you get, get these data, but, but in, in some sense, uh, you also wanna go back, right? So given these data, you wanna explain how you get the hyperbolic structure back. And there's one more ingredient that you need, and it's, it's the following. So these uh, developing map and the, uh, the connection, they're, they're related in, in some particular way, namely, um, uh, the property is that sigma restricts to oriented local uh, diffeomorphisms from 
the horizontal leaves. P bar. This is the property. Um, hmm? Oh, because they have a flat connection. So the, if there's a flat connection, then I can look at the horizontal foliation. Hmm? Uh, so so m maybe another way of putting this definition is uh, the, this, this property is that uh, the tangent bundle everywhere is a direct sum of the kernel of, of theta, so the horizontal spaces, and the kernel of this, the differential of this mapped signal. The counter mentions this is exactly right, but, but, but it's not just transverse, it's also compatible with orientation. So I'm, I'm gonna call uh, this property, uh, Theta is, I'm going to call it sigma positive. So in some sense, there's this certain transversality property in the picture. No, kernel of T sigma. So, so sigma is a map from P to D bar. So T sigma goes from TP to T D bar, and so, so we look at the kernel of that map. So, and, and, and why is this important? Um, well, it, because of this property, I mean, so, so first of all, why is it true? It's true because in local trivializations, uh, this map sigma is just this map phi alpha, which is a local diffeomorphism. Mm -hmm. that, that's why it holds. And why is it important? Because it allows you to reconstruct the hyperbolic structure. Namely, what you do is you have this local diffeomorphism. So you can take your hyperbolic metric on D bar, you just pull it back to the horizontal foliation. And because everything's G invariant, it descends. But you can go back and forth. Very good. Okay, so th this is the setting. So yeah, in this context with hyperbolic structures, there, there are some flat bundles in the picture already. The, the only problem maybe is that for every hyperbolic structure, you have a different bundle, strictly speaking. That's right, yeah, so, so if, if this was uh, D, just D, then this would be G mod K, and then and, and this, this would be, well, what, what they would call a, um, G mod K structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's locally modeled on this homogeneous space G mod K. So, so, so here it's modeled on, on D bar, which is not quite a homogeneous space, but almost as good. Right. Okay, so this is now what we want to put to use. Uh, yeah, may, maybe some, one more remark about this um, sigma. Yeah, so, so th this is actually their remark, which I hope you might find really interesting. So here it comes. <laughs> uh, so uh, remark. Um, so it's, it's about a uh, reduction of structure group. So um, on the interior, so if you take P and restrict it to the interior, uh, the map sigma is a G covariant map to, and it takes values in D, right? It doesn't hit the boundary. And D is G mod K. And we know for principal bundles, if you have a map from a principal bundle into some G mod K, that's equivalent to having a reduction of structure group to the group K. So it gives you this P sub K, reduction of structure group. On the boundary, it takes values in the boundary of the boundary, this, which is uh, G mod A n. It's also homogeneous space, but a very different one. And so you get, 
another reduction of structure group with the restriction of the boundary. So, so here I'm, I'm writing um, G S K A N. Well, these are like rotation matrices. So if, if I think PSL to R, then these are like rotation matrices and these are like upper triangular. So you get these two different reductions of structure groups and, and they somehow coexist. So th this is what the sigma is, is doing. It's, it's, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm doing a reduction of structure group, but I'm making it compatibly at the boundary and on the interior. On the, in, on the interior, I'm re reducing structure group to K. On the boundary, I'm reducing it to AN. And I can fit this together smoothly. Even though uh, even the dimensions of these groups are different. This is one dimensional, this is two dimensional. Yeah, yeah so th this is exactly what the sigma does, yeah. So this, this is the role of the sigma. Okay, so now, now, yeah, let's get back to flat connections and so on. Oh, this was 13. Let's do a bit here. So now let's actually fix this pair sigma, P sigma. I'm, I'm going to fix the principal G bundle and the developing section. I'm, I'm running short of time, so I probably cannot explain too much here. Um, you could take any hyperbolic matrix and take the P sigma coming from that, for instance. So even though, um, these pairs P sigma, they depend on the choice of hyperbolic metric. If you two, uh, choose two different ones, they're not the same, but they're always isomorphic. So it's, it's not, not a big deal to just, just fix one such pair. So th then we, we fix this pair P sigma, and then we look at the space of positive connections for that. And then what we find, is the space of hyperbolic structures is uh, well, it's flat connections on P, which are positive in the sense that I uh, said, that's uh, sigma positive, up to gauge transformations fixing this development section. So this is kind of easy fact, really. Um, so so we, we saw that for every hyperbolic structure, I can find this triple P theta sigma, and then I can just choose some identification with my given P sigma. So, so everything arises in this way. And conversely, if I have some connection that is sigma positive, then as I explained, it gives you a, it gives a hyperbolic metric. So yeah, you, you, have, you have this. Formula, which already looks kind of close to Atiyah bot things, right? Because on this space you have Atiyah bot two form. So now the question is how to descend things. Of course, we don't want to go to just Teichmüller space. We want to go all the way, so not, not to space hyperbolic metrics, we want to go down to Teichmüller space. So Teichmüller space, um, we have to caution further. We have to uh, go all the way uh, well, basically, this space has sort of the action of diffeomorphisms, and we should caution by diffeomorphisms fixing the boundary. So what that means is, if I do it in one step, I would caution by the automorphisms of P, uh, such that the base map uh, fixes the boundary, and it should still fix sigma and yeah, identity component of that. It's slightly cumbersome, but, but it's, it's, it's very concrete description as a quotient of a space of connections. So this looks kind of very good that 
somehow now you can take the symplectic structure here and it would descend. Yeah, and so, yeah, basically you would say you're done, right? So now you just uh, hope that the Atia bot form that you have on the space of connections, uh, it just descends. And this is the two form on the space of all connections. You just uh, restrict to flat connections and the sigma positivity is, is sort of like an open subset. Uh, you would hope it just descends. Yeah, un unfortunately, um, it doesn't. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like like one of those movies when the, when the villain is almost slain, right? And then, then <laughs> suddenly the hand starts moving again. So you think you're, you're totally done and, and then you're not. And the problem is that um, when we take this quotient by automorphisms, which fix such that the base map fixes the boundary, you still have the gauge transformations along the boundary. And the gauge transformations of the boundary, uh, they have the connection as the moment map and, um, well, it's, it's, it's not, you're taking that equal to zero or something. It, so it doesn't work quite like that. So in reality, uh, what we can make work is to do this in stages. So in some senses, this is true. I think I, yeah, lo long erased, of course, the numbers also gone. Um, this is some, some time ago, uh, we talked about these reductions first at zero and then at for cogent orbits. And so for cogent orbits, you take phi inverse of cogent orbit mod, mod g, but the two form doesn't directly descend and you do a shifting trick instead. A similar trick works here. Or we can do it in stages. Maybe that's better to explain. You first do space Teichmüller hat, where we don't uh, divide all these automorphisms. We only divide out automorphisms, which are really trivial along the boundary. So no, no, not even gauge transformations along the boundary. They don't take the full quotient yet. So here, um, indeed, curvature is uh, pretty much the mode map or, or this, this formula that I have for automorphisms. And this is really a symplectic quotient. I can say this also, uh, this is really a le legitimate symplectic quotient. But then on this space, we still have the gauge action of the boundary. Uh, so more precisely, what, what acts is gauge transformations of the boundary. So I'm using this notation now, dp means, uh, well, it is the boundary of, of, of p, right? It's the restriction of p to the boundary. And likewise, sigma, I can restrict to dp. Mm -hmm. So it's gauge transformations which preserve this p sigma still. So this group still acts on this space and has a moment map which is induced from uh, the connection and you can figure it out and, and, and you find that actually the image of the moment map for this action consists of a single coagent orbit. Therefore, then when you do the actual Teichmüller space, it's uh, you can say it like this, the quotient for a certain an orbit of this group, namely the, the, the image of the moment map uh, by this and you're done. So th this is not a reduction at zero, but at some other cogent orbit. And, and this works. And so, so th this way we get the symplectic structure on the space. And because everything is very explicit, you can figure out um, 
well, there's still this action of diffeomorphisms on the boundary on this space, but everything comes from the action of automorphisms where we had explicit moment maps in the beginning, right, from, from IT about construction. So you can just work out what it is and we just work out the formula compared to the formula that we had for hill operators on the boundary and we find that they're the same. So it actually all works. Yeah, so that, that's really how the construction goes. Yeah, I'm, I'm out of time. Um, maybe one last remark. Uh, I, I already mentioned that uh, in terms of examples, so the dual of the set of coach and orbits for VR Zoro was, was given by this picture. And these examples only give uh, examples of Hamiltonian VR Zoro spaces where the mode map takes values here, they're all hyperbolic. So in that sense, maybe not very rich, except, uh, okay, we, we had this example with uh, just the disk itself. That was this cogent orbit that, that also appeared. And yeah, for the cylinder, it's, it's the same thing. It's just, just here. So you might, might wonder what about, can we do more general examples where the other orbits would also play a role. Um, this is still somewhat under construction, but it seems like um, if you consider metrics with singularities, then you get uh, more general Hamiltonian Vera Zoro spaces. So uh, it's, it's metrics for, for which this transversality condition isn't everywhere uh, satisfied, but somewhere it's, it's, it's not entirely transverse and the metric actually becomes singular. Then if you do that, then you get some holon holonomies in the picture which are not hyperbolic and then more general moment map images will also arise. And yes, I'm sorry for running over time. Thank you for the